Somebody told me recently, they're like, you view life as like a side-scrolling video game. <laughs> you know, I came from a, whatever, generalist, primordial ooze of nerd. Thou shalt only approach with V6! I would buy that bumper sticker. Get to it, do it fast. Right here! On the Innycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here! On the Innycast. So, I am here today with uh, somebody who was a uh mentor idol i mean starting with idol then mentor oh then friend now back to mentor now back to idol um but somebody who uh who's really done it all seen it all uh, invented the internet uh avi friedman is here avi how are you sir hi matt good to speak to you uh it's always fun when people that are smarter than you are uh, idolize you because you wrote something and taught them something, you know, 20 years ago. So when you do that, people will always think that you're smarter and more accomplished than you actually are. Well, and uh, did I mention humble? Uh, I, I missed that in the intro as well. Um, so for, for the four people uh, who don't know actually who you are, um, give, us, uh, give us the 10,000 foot overview. Who are you? How did you get here? I am a computer hobbyist who was fortunate enough to get into computers in 1978 when I was eight. So that was not a lot of people getting into computers, uh, you know, as a kid back then and uh, fell into um, offering Internet access because there was no way to buy dial up Internet access in Philly when I was getting ready to leave Temple University. So I started the first ISP there and fell into infrastructure and have been broadly in and around uh, internet infrastructure since then. Um, about nine years ago, I uh, co-founded and run a company called Kentic, which started out as Cloud Helix, of which you are a customer. Um, and uh, before that, I was at uh, Server Central, which is now called Deft, and took up your mantle as CTO after you left to focus on your CDN and edge computing stuff. Allegedly. Allegedly. allegedly, that's what I'm focused allegedly, on. Allegedly, allegedly, edge. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so I mean, there's there's about a thousand jumping off points I have in yeah. my brain here, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Avi's BGP tutorial um, because uh, you know I, I'm a, a, a half a generation of internet internetness behind you, <laughs> and um, which, as you mentioned before we got on the air, makes us both old. Yes, um, <laughs> but. Um, like I remember trying, you know, the, the today the internet is this refined version. It's notwithstanding that it's chaos. It's like a refined version of what what there was in the the early and mid nineties. Um, but I remember just you know trying to figure out how things worked, and and everybody was like, oh, you go read Avi's BGP tutorial. Does it? I didn't even look. Does it still exist on the internet? Like if I uh, if people yeah, Google on my webpage although I'd, i know videos i need to find some nanog videos uh so we've got the board watch articles we have some powerpoints although i was embarrassed to see like bgp 101 is 300 slides or something <laughs> so uh but you know i came from a whatever generalist like primordial ooze of nerd that we came from before people specialized and so i knew what a slash 32 was or i guess i called it an ip address <laughs> um <laughs> and and i was like looking at this you know i posted to the may east tech mailing list like how do i get peering and bob gibson calls me it's like it's a secret it's a see i will indoctrinate <laughs> you into the society but you must not tell anyone and i'm like fuck yeah. that shit so, you know, I'm like, NLRI, why don't you just say IP addresses? And, you yeah. know, it was, it was just self-referentially worded. And uh, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I guess for, by the time I did BGP, uh, I had already done a leased line fact uh, from uh, Eskimo.com had a leased line fact. And I was like, that needs to be about three times longer. So I asked them permission. I made it longer. And then people started calling asking for T1s. Now, a lot of them were not in Philly, so it was not that helpful, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so now we call that content marketing. I was going to say, that's, you know, that sounds like you invented content. So hold on. So you invented the, the internet. You invented yeah, content marketing. This is, this is very illuminating. I invented a C program that looked like a BVS to get people into the, you, you, you know, into the internet back when you'd have to explain what the internet was. So you just say, 4,000 line chat board, and people are like, oh my God. So Amazing. Uh, you know, IRC, look at that. And then, you know, the BGP stuff, I was just like, 
I remember having these epiphanies. I'm like, why don't they explain this shit? It's like the reason IBGP is so frustrating is because there's no loop detection. The reason EBGP advertises everything as well because they were just wrong in terms of how they designed it. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and but like there's some things, that, and you know, you go to you go to the wizards, and they're like, oh yeah, of course everyone knows that. I'm like, it's not in the fucking docs. Uh, and, and the dots are written, they say, oh, the F, the NLRI is blah, 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 blah. And that was before MPLS, right, even. So right. I was just like, well, this is pretty stupid. Let's just document that. And then, right. you know, I was like, okay, I have my own company. And so let me just publish my configs and people can see. Now, I was a little bit on the wrong side religion-wise because I like confederations because right. it's sort of like observability, right? You could see the internal flow of your pops in the AS path. So I was an early observability fan, but you know, if you could embed it in BGP, as opposed to like loopbacks and route reflectors and stuff like that, it's like, okay, yeah, I guess it's more, I don't know. It scales. People do it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it scales better, but uh, uh, you know, well, we had a small enough infrastructure at NetAccess. So yeah, I fell right. into it. No, I didn't have any mentors saying, be long-term greedy. You will do well by doing good, like, you know, the Tom Lehrer song, by, you know, luring people in and making them think that you're nice. So in, in my case, it was just like, like being an entrepreneur, sometimes the pressure builds up and I'm like, I can't stand that this is so confusing. I must explain it. <laughs> well, it, so that you, 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 you get clearer, right? Like to, when, as soon as you have to teach something, it like yes, of course. helps solidify your yeah. ideas, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Someone was like, again, someone, I remember someone asking me, why is this EB, IBGP stuff so complicated? And I'm like... Let me think about that. I was like, wait, there's no group protection. Hmm. And then I went to the Wizards. I don't know if it was Dave Rand or Alec Peterson or someone. I was like, yeah, everybody knows that. I'm like, okay, yeah. it is known. Well, I didn't know it, so let me document it. So I try to tell people now, you may think that you know, you're an idiot because you don't know this, uh, you know, but you need to ask, please say, foundational questions, not dumb questions. Uh, but you know, one of the great ways if you're early in career – well, to demonstrate that someone should hire you is just document your learning process because it will not make you look stupid. It'll make you look actually uh, curious and intelligent. Uh, Julia Evans has done that. I don't know if you've seen her zines, but like she does it on, uh, you know, Linux networking. God help us, DNS, which I still is like in a cane art where I like wave chickens over my head and call Rob Seastro, and I'm like, what the hell is going on yeah. here? <laughs> uh, I recently had to fight with my. Uh... Uh, what was it? Not my SPF record, my uh, DKIM signing key. Yes. And it was like, oh, actually, it splits it into two packets uh, because it's too long, but it's not so long that it, you need to use TCP. And I was just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> for, for the love of God, why? I like to say that networking is lots of little simple things that converge in complex ways mixed with vendor bugs. So Yes, I like that. I would, I would buy that bumper sticker uh, okay. if, on the Avi store. What you said something like you kept coming back to something in there, and as I th heard you saying it, I don't know if you can't do it anymore. It's probably just harder. Like if for a new person today, you like break the access, internet? no access to the wizards. Uh, uh, like the wizards are a little more, a few degrees of separation removed from from people today. That wasn't the case uh, when everybody was starting. Like we, the internet, you know, engineering space was a pretty flat corporate hierarchy back then. Is it still like, can you well, just show I, up to, to a nanog today and meet the wizards? I mean, I think if you're in a work environment, there will generally be wizards mm. around or one degree of separation. And I know a lot of wizards that are still very helpful of Padawans. If you demonstrate that you're actually looking to learn, if you're like, you know, the person that's like, could you help me with my IT stuff? How do I do this? And then you try to tell them and they're like, la, 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 I'm stupid. I can't understand. Like, that's not going to work. But if you are a Padawan and you ask good questions and you come back, then I think there's still a lot of those wizards around. Now, that's a separate question is how do you break into networking? And neither of us can talk about it from an inclusive perspective, uh, you know, of, yeah. of, 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 you know, sort of because there's an awful lot of, well, whether they found a Zempic and are overweight or not, uh, you know, <laughs> old white dudes. There are a lot of old white dudes in networking, for sure. You know, and so I don't know, you know, firsthand there, but, you know, I know a lot of people try to be welcoming. Uh, and Nanog itself tries to be very welcoming of members dinners and, and uh, you know, um, and, and for different groups to get together. So, you know, I, my impression is that it's still, if not easy, at least possible. Now, if you're very introverted, if you're not comfortable talking to people, 
Um, you know, I guess it's harder, but uh, I think it's, it, you know, it's a community that tries to be welcome because I think there's also concern. I mean, what happens when people, you know, Martin Levy is retired. It's like, oh my yeah, God, one of the wizards is gone. There's um, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, um, I don't know the polite phrase. This, yeah, there's yeah. castles popping up, popping up in the wilderness. And I do imagine he let his hair grow and has his wizard staff <laughs> and is at the top of the bed. Get off my lawn! <laughs> you know, <laughs> thou shalt only approach with V6! Uh, but, but uh, you know, I think, but, Actually, a lot of those people are still going to Nanog and hanging out, even though they're not employed, just because you right. know, you've been with people for 30 years, then you want to you know, still meet those people. So, yeah, I think it's possible. And I think there's a lot of content marketing, and I think it is definitely harder to be full stack. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you haven't grown up ripping computers apart and understanding that you can control them, and then it's just things that other people built, and you're just a person. So there's nothing that the great gods have done that we can't understand then it's harder. But uh, on the other hand, you look at eBPF, you look at a lot of the packet stuff, you look at the great debates in cloud. Is it a network mesh? Is it a cloud mesh? Is it an app mesh? Is it a load balancer? You know, and and, and so to get into those conversations, you know, you're, you're already thinking about all these, you know, primitives that go between, you know, network operating system, storage, et cetera, especially the eBPF space. So, you know, I think it's possible, but it definitely... You know, you got to have time and interest, um, and and uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot of money anymore, but right. you just have to have, definitely have to have time and interest. Yeah, and like, uh, you know, my my concern, for lack of a better word, of the next generation is uh, their the changing in what a primitive is, right? Like right. where it's 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 not a piece of hardware; it's an API that. call. Well, not even that, right? Like it's, it's, it's not, there's no such thing as a server. There's only a thing I can spin up and I don't know what happens. Like, I don't know what happens under that layer. Uh, like what is a server? I don't know. Just CPUs and memory shows up for me. Well, we see this, you know, a few ways when we interview people to hire them for the, I'll call it the backend team. No, not backend Mm -hmm. of front end, which is APIs, but the backend that builds our database and stuff like that. You know, we ask them to do things that you know, embedded in there and we'll tell people we're not like Microsoft interviewing is like, please don't overwhelm the systems because, you know, compute moves much faster than storage. And, you know, you can still fill the queues and all the stuff that you need to know to build a CDN, for example, right. Which is at the intersection of these things. And and it's hard if you haven't ever, if no one's ever told you, you know, that, uh, you know, IO weight can, you know, block the system or, you know, how to architect things because Linux is still, stupid enough that I hate to say it because I hated VM, using VMS, but like VMS was nice because you got to kill a process if it's waiting on IO, you know, right. Linux, you still can't kill a process if it's waiting on IO. So how do you architect around that? So you don't have a multi-threaded thing. That's part of a process that'll just die and you can't kill it. And it's a zombie and, you know, God yeah. help us. So uh, a lot of those things also, you know, unless you find the book of practical, how do you do it is, is hard. And then, we're seeing this in the enterprise where for the first few years post, you know, real cloud adoption, you were thinking that the, uh, you know, a lot of companies had the app teams try to run that infrastructure. It's like, why do my Kubernetes clusters not talk to each other? And how do I get to the Twilio API? I'm like, I don't yeah. know. Amazon, Uncle, Uncle Jeff or Uncle Jared will figure it out for me. <laughs> um, right. And you still have Splunk, now Cisco, now Crisco. Uh, whatever. Um, yeah. And and you've got and Datadog who think that network stops at eBPF inside the server. It's like okay, well, you have analysts saying, uh, well, the service meshes are going to talk to each other through you know again APIs. It's like well, yeah. Okay, but there's still stuff happening underneath. Yes, and there's a few more are, layers. Yes, but we see IT teams that run infrastructure having to run this now. I mean, it's good for Kentic, my day job, uh, but um, you know, I think there's still even in the analyst circles people that think that. Uh, well, the network people, you know, are just going to go away because it's only routers and switches. But I mean, if you look at routing tables and ACLs and tunnels, right? With those three things, you've got like the network in cloud is just those things with weird software and bugs and names. And then how it all comes together. That's what the APIs are doing. And sometimes it doesn't work and you need to figure it out, especially in a cross-cloud way, especially if the internet comes in. So I think there's more understanding of that, at least inside IT and security teams, 
Mm -hmm. On the developer side, yeah, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, if people have grown up in the cloud, then we definitely see some people that are like, okay, well, especially when they go multi-cloud, it's like, okay, now how do I figure this out? Uh, instead of scrying at syslog or whatever to figure out that they have a policy problem. <laughs> they, you know, they basically ackled themselves out, which you could do in the cloud too. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's interesting. If you put your maybe slightly more CEO hat on, or at least tilt it slightly less to the side, what does it look like? Like Kentik's obviously been on a journey. Um, and today that journey looks like moving into the enterprise. Um, what has that journey been like for you personally and for the company? Cause I mean, that's a, as somebody who grew out of, of not the, or grew into and out of, and, and not the enterprise. Like to me, that's always a scary place like i come from a, a point of view where it's like oh you should just use the best technology not and that's what wins not you know the people who navigate the procurement process best win mm -hmm. well it's a very deep topic uh and we can talk later about the streaming telemetry because kintic is coming out with npm which is streaming mm. telemetry at snmp mixed together but you know there was someone that i was talking to at a web scale company i won't name their name or even tell you what letter it starts with. And I, I was just talking about like, SNP is not going away. You know, it's like before, but worse. And, <laughs> uh, and he said, well, if you work for a company, and this is someone that cares deeply about diversity. And he said, well, you know, if you work for a company that won't throw out everything and get Aristas, then they're poor and you should quit. I'm like, do you hear yourself? <laughs> uh, you know, the enterprise, it, when we started at, you know, Kentic, we, you know, we assumed interface classification. Awesome. People have regular expressions we can grab to to figure out whether an interface is external or internal. And then you run into enterprise where the, they have people tenured for 30 years and they're still not the ones that set up the network. Uh, right. You know, it happened before them when it was Novell or whatever. And so if there is an interface description, it, it's probably suspect. Now everyone's getting on the automation train, whatever, but there's definitely different cultures definitely different drivers. And it's not that one side is smarter or, you know, than the other, but you know, an enterprise certainly lives much more ticket based. Uh, and yes, I would say in the old world, the web companies were more like, it tastes good. Let's buy more. And, you know, the enterprise were a little bit more of that kind of purchasing process. The champions can't talk to you. I would say the web companies, the, the, the digital natives that grew up around the internet, they're becoming more like that, right? I mean, it's a tough economic time. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you see that in your business. Uh, you know, people aren't buying ahead as much. But certainly the traditional enterprise are much less likely to DIY tool user, tool, tool, tool makers. And it's not, again, because they can't. It's just the, the culture and the way things are. It's very very multi multitask, lots of different groups. They're ISPs to their own internal companies. Um, and, you know, just the way it is. So I think it's less about that vertical and more about, look, for me personally, kid takes a couple hundred people, tens and tens of millions of dollars of revenue. People engineering is a lot harder than, you know, engineering engineering. Not that computer yeah. science is actual science or that software engineering is actual engineering or network engineering is banging on. It's like being a garage mechanic, really. But, yeah. uh, but you know, when you're in business, you think you are choosing between three questions, three answers to a question. You might not even be asking the right question, much less you might not have the right possibilities, which is why it's good to bring in people that are not just like you, not just your friends, right. because maybe they have different perspectives. And that's what I signed up for, but it definitely humbles you. And, uh, you know, you see sometimes, well, why didn't I think of that? And this is happening over here. Um, so ultimately it's fun because if you, uh, you know, have a one man band it can only sound so good. You only have so many customers, so many admirers, uh, so many employees and, uh, you know, that stuff is fun too. So, uh, sure. I'm definitely happy with the, way we've chosen. And, and in the last 18 months for Kentec, those large enterprise, you know, definitely fund it to get in and work with in their, in, you know, in a different way. Again, less sure. likely to start with the API, but we're solving big problems for them. And, you know, that's fun. Yeah. And like, if, if anything, there's you're probably providing more value uh, to some of those enterprises because of what you said, the, yeah. the, the interface classification problem shows up <laughs> in about 50 different ways, right? Which is like, yeah. wait, we're doing what? <laughs> if the well, traffic's no, and, going and, and, where? 
I was always, you know, I had backwards think. I had a very nerd think. I was like, eh, you know, whatever, SNMP, it's too easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want to sell that. I mean, whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, Solar Winds is like your old middle school prom date that you have fun memories of but wouldn't be in a relationship with. But, right. you know, people use it and, and, and you know, and the web company's like, yeah, whatever, Influx will throw the stuff in there. It's fine. It's good enough. But people want it to be integrated. So, uh, you know, we have a different set of things. And again, if you listen, the customers will guide you to what they want. Uh, and yes, they're less likely to build the first version of it themselves, which is a, a good, you know, different dynamic. Yeah, and I, I like I have a hard time remembering too that like as somebody who's ninety nine percent on the web web scale slash internet y side of things, you know, everything we do for ourselves and for our customers is like above the line. Mm -hmm. So like it's it is the business. Uh, and enterprise is interesting because a lot of what, you know, IT or engineering is doing is not the business. Uh, it has nothing well, to do with the, the business. Revenue. It supports the business. Right. It's it supports the, the business. But the people are the business in some sense too, right? And sure. So if you're supporting the people, but it isn't that the revenue aren't the packets, right? That's the production networking versus a lot well, of that. Yeah, IT. and not even the right. Like it's it's the the IT is not the cogs frequently, right? Depending on what you're doing, and that's right. that's yeah. that's sort of what I was getting at. Is like you're you're below the line in terms of that spending is not something that directly contributes to your gross margin. So why are you trying to optimize it necessarily? Um, how do we, you know, do less of this? Whereas when it's your cogs, you're like, how do we do more of it in a more efficient way? But, you know, in some, my example is always like for our customers. I'm like, I want, I, I, my customers should want to spend a trillion dollars a month with me. Because if right. they're spending a trillion dollars a month with me, that means they're making nine trillion dollars, um, and that isn't the case in a lot of enterprises where that that budget is like it doesn't scale to revenue necessarily. It scales to people or right. or something, but it, it's not really like direct directly related to it. And I think I approach most infrastructure challenges with that in mind, right? Of like, well, if if you do do this better, smarter, then this over here immediately gets higher, more margin-y. And in a lot of enterprise cases, that's not the case. It just means your budget shrinks. And in enterprise, you don't want your budget to shrink. You want your budget to grow. So you need to f you figure out how to, to invest it over here now. Um, and like to me, that's always a hard mental calculation is like it, that it's not COGS frequently. Um, right. Well, I think you get to reallocate, right? If you can help people be more efficient, then they can do things that drive the business uh, more, better, faster, help people deploy faster. I mean, we're starting to see network people thinking about deploying code faster it's not they're deploying the code and that's what cloud was about in a lot of cases mm -hmm. but i don't need to open up a ticket to set up a vlan and set up a vm and you know set up some infrastructure um so in some cases it's not shrinking in some cases it is shrinking or especially on the you know on the platform or tools side uh so you know i guess it just depends there yeah and you said something interesting as well about uh, you know, sometimes in business, you're not, you, you realize you're, you were never even asking the right question. Mm -hmm. And like, I know Simon Sinek has the, the sort of vogue thing now is the, you know, business is an infinite game. Uh, you know, you're trying to put, you're trying to apply finite rules to an infinite game. Um, but all of that specifically with you takes me to like, for those who don't know, you've played a lot of poker in your life at a, at the, the highest of levels. Um, does that help or hurt in a, in a world where like the the game of business has like so f few constraints? Like you're you're doing a probability calculation, but then you know Godzilla shows up and eats Tokyo, and it's just like okay, so nothing that I was using actually happened. Like how how does it help or how does it hurt, and and how do you view that? I mean, obviously there's it it works both ways, but how do you view your your poker skills in a business light? Well, first of all, I think every professional can use uh, some obsession, something they like doing that takes them out of the headspace of what they're doing professionally, because uh, A, it can reduce stress, and B, maybe I shouldn't generalize, but for me and some other people that I know, uh, sometimes when you're sort of stuck thinking about something and you, your head is in the problem space, so you need to sort of disconnect. And then the answer will magically come to you as your background processors start thinking about it. Yeah. And uh, 
poker is incredibly freaking boring unless you're, you know, it's like baseball. Unless you actually are having great conversations, it's actually pretty boring. Um, yeah. So uh, I play, I prefer Pot Limit Omaha, which is less boring because you have to fold less. But it's still the moments of sheer puckering terror or fun are, you know, few and far between in poker. Um, and so you certainly have time to sit and think. I think the discipline of it is also helpful because uh, you really have to know and believe that life is one long session. So, mm. you know, just because I didn't get it done this week, this month, this year, I think there's an analogy in business. I've seen people get frantic because they must achieve whatever it is right now. And sometimes the market's not ready. The organization is overloaded. The customer's not ready, whatever it is. And in poker, you can really have very bad results if you decide I'm not going to leave this table down money because, well, hope is not a strategy. Um, right. Whereas if you say, you know what, I can play if you can, if it's true, you can play poker enough, then you know, life is one long session. Whatever happens today nets out with tomorrow. So I think the patience uh, is uh, important and sometimes seeing it in a different domain. I don't want to get too uh, nerdy, but, you know, it's sort of like abstract algebra where you transform into a different domain. And sometimes insights can be more clear when you're thinking in frequency domain or whatever than, you know, within in the world that you see and are sort of used to. So getting out of your head, uh, you know, understanding that. And, you know, look, in business, uh, when you're negotiating, um, when you're thinking about strategy, there's certainly a lot of reading people. And I think there are people that are very good at the, you know, I, I at the, I just look at you and, and know that you've got more room. Uh, I think that you can be 85th percentile good if you just have a good bullshit detector, right? And, and poker teaches that too. It's like, why would they be doing this? Does this make sense? What is this story? Um, and so, yeah, um, I, think, I think those are skills that translate uh, too and are helpful. And it's a good way to sharpen those uh, in a different domain. Yeah, like I, when I asked the question, I had mostly thinking strategy, like sort of high level strategy involved as well as negotiations. But going back to something you said earlier about being a people org now, um, does it make you better at, at, at re reading like internal people? Like, does it, do you feel like you have an advantage in trying to understand what's going on compared to, you know, somebody who might come in and say, you know, I'm not really that great at reading people, but, uh, I do have to manage or lead them today. So here we go. I think that I've, I don't know whether I'm any better at that than I was 10 years ago. And, you know, at Akamai, my, I had two business cards when I started. One was Chief Sushi Consumption Officer, and the other was Optimizer of Economic Inefficiencies, because I came in and was like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I need to change this. So I think I've always been okay at it. And we definitely had to consult the lawyers because, you know, uh, uh, I knew things from signing an NDA as me as the ISP and someone was telling me something different as me as Akamai. And so I had to go to the lawyers and like, can I call bullshit? Because like, you know, I've signed an NDA over here. So I can't tell you what the, I can't tell you why I know that they're, they're full of but shit. It's bullshit. But <laughs> it is bullshit. And so yes, yeah. you can say that, but you can't explain why. But I think I've gone much more with my spidey sense. Uh, mm. You know, and, um, also I think, there isn't a lot of that internally and we're still can always do a better job, but we really try to screen for curiosity and against drama. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that when they're bored will just create drama because they're bored and that can really be disruptive to an organization. So, um, you know, we try to screen that and politics out at the same time. Um, there are ways in which we could do better at, at giving praise, you know, cause some of the cultures that I grew up in, like, you know, we we're talking about the wizards, you know, the wizard wouldn't necessarily give you the answer. They would sort of give you the direction and point and it would be expected that you would go and come back and ask more questions and that, you know, they wouldn't applaud you when you, you know, figured it out. They would just give you the next 
the next mission right. and spell to try to figure out. And, you know, when I was learning, I got my first Unix machine, the wizard, Steve Robinson. I was like, what shall I do to achieve enlightenment? He's like, uh, run find slash and tell me what everything, you know, and like figure out what all the files on the file system are. This was yeah. system three. So there were many fewer files on the file system, but even so that was a, a summer long mission. And that was his goal was, right. you know, okay. And, and through that, you will ask a bunch of questions. Now, you know, if you're at MIT, which I did not get into, I, I got rejected multiple times from MIT and Stanford and and UIUC and uh, and uh, Carnegie Mellon and UT Austin and all you know all those places. But uh, you know, in a lot of those I- environments, if you solve a hard problem, you know, they'll be like, "Oh, cool, what's next?" You know, not like, "Oh my God, that was so amazing," because it's assumed that you're super good. And are going to solve hard problems, uh, or sometimes right. you might get a quiet nod or something. And so, in business, uh, especially with a lot of different cultures of people that come to it, you know, we need to give more recognition. On the other hand, if you put enough, uh, you know, of people that are from that culture, and all of a sudden they see people getting praised because you know they put the toilet lid down, then that can be very demotivating too. So you need to find a path in the middle that where, where people feel that you see and understand. Uh, you know what they're doing that's that's good and above above uh, you know above the above what's required, um, but you know you don't. And I saw this in in some companies that I've been at where there was a, a time when people left and the senior management didn't really understand what was really great or not, and it turned into demotivating. So we're still trying to do the best job at that. And I know yeah. you've seen companies where there's been that kind of stuff, uh, you know, too. So yeah, and like. It's hard because it's. I mean, as a, as a leader, it's it's hard to. It's way easier, and I don't know if that's the right word for me to be like, oh hey, I just saw you make a mistake. Then oh hey, I just saw you do a good job, mm-hmm. because one was my baseline assumption of what you would do, <laughs> and <Right>. so, <laughs> so I and and I don't want to be patronizing and like be seal clapping at people like wow it was amazing that today you showed up and did your job that was like right. unbelievable um so it's like finding that line where it's it's not insincere and it's not it's like well, I, I like the, the way you went about doing it the world has biased you know a little more towards recognition from 20 30 years ago you know mm-hmm. at least the cultures that we grew up in so um you know it's definitely something to be thoughtful of and try to do better at yeah so um what were you like as a student? You mentioned uh you mentioned some schools, but like this is always a, I, I ask this to most entrepreneurs because they almost all have the same answer, but I'm I'm curious what you were so, like as a student. Last year, no, two years ago, someone said something to me that made me think, you know what? maybe I should actually try ADHD medication, uh, which I did for a day. And then I just decided, but in that, in that, uh, in that uh, process, they ask you about that. And, you know, I said, I was either the favorite best student they had ever had or a spawn of the devil that they literally threw erasers at and did everything they could to thwart my progress, uh, you know, bureaucratically uh, because I had, no respect for authority because they were in authority and a lot of respect for people that are good teachers and, you know, cared and were curious. Uh, now I didn't act out other than not showing my work or, you know, turning in homework late or whatever. And, you know, somehow in college I just decided, okay, well, I mean, I don't actually have a degree, but should have a degree, but you know, I just decided, okay, it's easy enough to get straight A's. I'll just do that. Uh, whereas in high school I was like, yeah, I don't really want to write that essay. Uh, so that's what I was like, uh, as a student, uh, pain in the ass. And then at Temple university was awesome because I, you know, the first day I walked in and you know, there were these two guys sitting down and the one guy was like, Oh, I do the computer network stuff. Like that sounds boring as shit. And the other guy said, (laughs) Uh, the other guy said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a doctor and I do image processing. I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. I've done some AI stuff. Uh, yeah. Do you have a symbolics? Uh, it turns out I didn't quite go that way. But uh, and I was like, you know, hey, can I can I start taking advanced classes? They're like, yeah, we'll let you hang yourself, whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, but in college also, 
I was able to Temple didn't care that you did things in the right order as long as you had the right things at the end. So that also yeah. probably helped that I, you know, could inhabit take over Network of Sun workstations and do fun stuff at the same time as I was uh, you know, doing the other stuff. Yeah, well you're Unsurprisingly, your answer is the same as every other entrepreneur. What were you like as a student? I was the same. I was, uh, well, so the way I would summarize it as a group is people were capable of doing well in things they felt like doing well in. Yes. And and the other stuff, not so much. uh, Yes. Because they didn't respect the system or they didn't, they didn't like the rules. Um, I think it's okay to just be lazy. My father said when I was growing up, you know, you're lazy. I'm like, Yes. You're right. Yeah. So, no, I'm but not that's a skill. against your. You have the authority to ask me to mow the lawn. I recognize your authority. I'm not rebelling <laughs> against your authority. I just would rather read a book. <laughs> right. Well, and but also like the way that shows up. Like I, I was the opposite. None of it made sense. Like in Ontario, 51s were passes mm-hmm. in high school. So I was like 51 in computer science. Um, but like for every project, like I was, there's 28 people in my class. I completed 27 projects. <laughs> right like i helped everybody with their project but i had no interest right. in doing mine like i didn't understand the point of me doing the project um right. but i was happy to go around and do the project and help people with the project and uh there's it's things like that are, are seem to be common where it's just like i wasn't against the learning i was against the specific application of the way it's measured and taught and whatever and you know i like to have a good uh, debate from time to mm-hmm. time. So I would, you know, I would tell teachers all the time. I'm like, what do you like? That's not how the real world works. Like, you know, <laughs> we're preparing you for the real world. I'm like, what real world are you talking about? Like, you know, yeah. show, show me a stuff. Like I, I, I was always good at tests. Right. So I was just like, listen, and the point of the homework is to make me good at tests. Right. Right. So if I got a, uh, you know, 85 on the test, can we then therefore assume I did the homework and, right. and, and tell me about this real world in which you, f- you know, Kentech's going to fire their top sales rep because they found out he didn't read the sales manual. Um, that's just not, that's not how it works. It's like, you don't, it doesn't matter in the real world. Nobody's going to say, yeah. Ooh, actually you didn't do the work. Now, yeah, if the somehow, work was required, that's different. Somehow I survived at Temple, uh, when I came in. Uh, yeah, they were using Pascal and VMS, and I'm like, no one's going to use this. Unix is the way, you know. Yeah. And it was a little religious. Uh, so I wrote a, I said, I refuse, I, I will take a Pascal class, which I did one, but I wrote a C to Pascal translator, and I handed in C code with the C to Pascal translator as, you know, it was like, who, who does that? Uh, yeah. You know, just, <laughs> just applied perversity. Uh, yeah. But, you know, look, in hindsight, I was right. I was right. There you go. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't think I've I've told anybody this, but I was in a room like a year ago. There's like, it was a throwaway comment, not directed at me in particular. The person who said it had no idea any of my background probably. Um, but it like, it keeps me up at night even now. Uh, because I, I dropped out of high school to start the, my first business. And he said, I, I forget the exact quote, but it was something like, you know, I, it's always interesting being around entrepreneurs who didn't go to a university because they never got to see all the different ways that smart shows up. Hmm. And so they have a very narrow view of like what a smart person is. Uh, and I think about that all the time now. Cause I'm like, when I watch somebody do something or, or we're interviewing somebody, I'm like, I'm frustrated that they're like, not doing it, not solving the problem my way or like not in the way that I think would be the smart way. And then I'm like, but then again, uh, you know, I'm, I haven't been around in not like there is just, the premise was like, you're never in your life going to be around that many smart people all at the same time, solving entirely different problems and t- entirely different tracks and getting an opportunity to see peers, you know, solve math problems versus English problems versus history problems in all the different ways. Whereas reality, you could be sitting there and going, well, I definitely couldn't pass that class, that class, that class, that class, that class, or that class, but that person can, and that person can, and that person can, and that person can. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I almost had a, if I had graduated, I would have had a minor in classics uh, mm. because I liked the guy that taught 
intellectual heritage, which was like a sampler thing. And so I took some philosophy and NLP was interesting to me at the time. So, yep. you know, theories of language and stuff like that. And, you know, definitely, definitely some different, uh, certainly smart people, but exhibit, you know, in different ways, uh, you know, that I saw now in my case, it was helpful for my Akamai career that I had that background in computer science. Cause I think, I probably, I had actually done SICP and because I'd done Lisp and Scheme and stuff uh, before Temple University. So I'd seen some of that blow your mind, different thinking, uh, theory of computation and, and like languages interpreting themselves and stuff like that. But, you know, I think there was still some data structures. I mean, I think operating system stuff I'd picked up. But there was definitely stuff that by the time I got to Akamai, I discovered that you don't have to be 95th percentile at everything. If you're 80th percentile at 10 different things, then you're actually like pretty super powered. And so the right. ability to speak, like there's a gentleman who's a, a computer science professor at, at, at MIT who came up to me my first week at Akamai. He's like, oh, someone from the internet. The internet department showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Avi, did you know that the triangle inequality does not hold on the internet? I'm like, yeah, that's how peering works is like, sometimes it's faster to go indirectly is like, uh, I said, you should say that. And he's like, no, no, that's what I said. I was like, no, 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 you spoke math. <laughs> <laughs> like, like now I granted that's just like, you know, high school geometry, but still being yeah. able to speak, uh, the language of computer science was helpful in that, in that culture, or I'm sure it's helpful at Google or other. So I probably wouldn't have, you know, I've got the new books up there, which I have not read. Um, <laughs> They would give me a headache, but, um, you know, uh, I, you know, it's still helpful to be able to sure. translate and, and you need to know when it's important to go find the smartest person to go solve some problem, uh, and pattern match. And it's certainly in distributed systems. So I think I'm glad for that, you know, as well as the having seen my father, uh, did the five year, four year, four or five year, I think five year poof, you're a doctor program. So it was Penn mm -hmm. state. And, uh, it was like, and he often says, said, uh, and says, uh, that, uh, he wish he had had more of an exposure to the other areas, uh, you know, the social stuff. Um, uh, and so, you know, yeah, I'm happy with it. Even though I don't have a degree, I'm happy that I spent the time. Yeah. Well, that's it, right? It's like, what, it, has anybody ever asked you to produce the degree? Well, I don't claim to have one to be clear. Okay, so that. Well, you, and, I'm sure at some point you were telling people you went there. Uh, oh, no, I said I went there. I mean, yeah. But and nobody like, was like, oh, my God, did you finish? Can you prove it? No, I mean, when I was there, you know, a lot of the graduate students called me Dr. Friedman. because I'm like, that's my father. If you have a lung problem, you can go see him. <laughs> because, you know, like I wrote this distributed system toolkit, which, I mean, it was, it was uh, Yuan Shi's idea, but it hadn't been implemented. And I was took a summer and I wrote... Uh, a tuple space demon and a shared memory demon and a uh, Gazinta Kazauda demon and you know like a lot of and and a policy language that would fire up the processes on a distributed system, make sure they were running, hook them up to these distributed IPC stuff that you had config files for. It wasn't YAML and it wasn't. So it I was going to say like, you also invented DevOps, is what I just heard. Right. Well, not just DevOps. Akamai should have invented DevOps because they actually invented this stuff. But a lot of the yeah. you know it's not containers, but the sort of Kubernetes and managing stuff. And but it was his idea, and I implemented it. But then there were a bunch of other people to work on it, and mm. you know they came to me to ask me ideas, or you know I was a lab. But I had a, I had an office. I own bigboy.cis.temple.edu. We ran MUDs, uh, and so um, you know people assumed that I was you know whatever. I was just a student, so you know I mean it was fine. Uh, and it was because ironically, it was because of my laziness and the fact that I was administering the physics and math more at that point probably the math uh, department computers that I build them late and they're like, well, we can't pay you now. So I took them to small claims court and they're like, ha guess what? You need to take Fortran to graduate. And so I did one semester at Stony Brook and I'm like, do you care if I don't have an actual degree for the PhD program? And they're like, wait, wait, we'll get back to you. I was like, nope, that's okay. Come. And so I did one semester. I had a research assistantship, uh, but then I 
uh, I mean, net access was already taking off and I needed to go pay attention to it. So, uh, sorry, go back to the part where you took them to small claims court. <laughs> <laughs> My mother is a tax attorney and she's like, well, if they're not suing you, if they're not, if they're not paying, then, you know, you can sue them for it. So them, uh, them being temple who yeah, you were, they, they where you were both a practice. student and the administ and, yes. and running the computer. In hindsight, okay. maybe it wasn't the right decision. Uh, I'm starting to I'm starting to to see some of the reasons why you might not have left with a diploma. Well, no, they asked. So after that, I would go back and talk to the senior classes, and you know there were like people with the little potato eyes that were like, "I need a job, I need a job," and then there'd be the the people with the bright shiny eyes like, "Ooh, this is interesting." But I, yeah. I realized the senior level is too late to try to tell people like, you need to figure out what's interesting and make that a career versus just like learning skills like Votech and hoping that someone will give you a job. Um, right. But about that time they were like, you know, for $10,000, we could put you in the arts of sciences hall of fame and give you a degree, a degree <laughs> like, like Bill Cosby. And that was at a time before, you know, when, when that yeah. was cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, being in Philly and I was like, eh, you know, I think I'd already sold net access. I was, ah, come I was like, I don't, I don't need it. It's fine. Like, thank yeah. you very much. If I can help for free, that's fine. Otherwise yeah. I'm still a little bit pissed at you. My wife is very pissed at them. So I just got a thing from the temple alumni. I think they don't know what that means. They should check with their Latin department. Okay. <laughs> um, so like thinking back from, from today back to that, you know, what were your preconceived notions at the time of where, what the internet was going to be and where it is all going and how far from that, are we now like if you think back net access days to today you, you had a, some sort of trajectory in your mind i'm right. sure about where the internet was going to be well let me answer that two ways because i realized that it's very easy for people i'll say in our crowd to be uh self-absorbed entitled i won't use the b word but uh go, you know, go on uh, people uh, yeah. and, and I just think back to when I was hanging out, you know, writing muds and reading Usenet with RN and, uh, you know, writing code, if someone had showed up at the door and said like, I will pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year inflation adjusted to, uh, to play with, you know, to administer large systems and write distributed systems for the rest of your life, you have to sign in blood. And you go to hell if you, you know, uh, you know, violate the contract. I would have said, awesome. That sounds good to me. So obviously we're all very lucky that the world has grown to value, you know, what we do. As I said, the, the entrepreneurial sense of people need this to exist and it's not that hard to make exist. Maybe I should do that. It's been right. It's not 10 years ahead of time. I mean, maybe mm. packet fabric was 10 years ahead of its time, but still, like when I started net access, it was like, oh, I want dial up access and there's no way to get it unless I'm at a university or join a company that I don't want to work at. So how hard can this be? I ran public access machines. But in 1992, I wasn't thinking people would have IP addresses at home with shell accounts. Mm -hmm. So I was very enthused about the internet, but it was like gopher. And I tried type WWW and I'm like, what the hell is this? I don't, whatever. And so I'm obviously thrilled from a connection perspective and what it enables a little depressed that people aren't thankful, aren't like, Oh my God, there's Khan Academy. I can learn anything I want to learn. And you know, as long as you have enough sleep and enough to eat, like it seems like a pretty magical world that we live in now uh, mm -hmm. that a lot of people aren't like, Oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> they're, they're, they, you know, uh, and I think that's our job to teach them how awesome that is. And then obviously, look, there's a lot of issues with the way things have gone, uh, in terms of, uh, social media and, you know, uh, I'm not against AI, but obviously it's going to be easier to manipulate people. It's not like yeah. Ender's game where you had these kids pretending to be, you know, uh, uh, rabble rousers, but it was still all disciplined reason discourse. That's not what seems to happen. Uh, mm. but you know, I'm thrilled that the world has gone to the place where skills that I wanted to develop and think are interesting are valuable. That's obviously amazing. And, yeah. uh, I'm glad that we can connect people and COVID really brought that home. Right. You know, sure. it's like, wow, 
actually don't need to see each other. I mean, we want to see each other, but we can run the business without it. So I think that's pretty cool. But yeah. when I get frustrated in life or business or whatever, I just think back, how bad, how bad is it really? You know, go talk to some customers and think back to that, that time in college and it was like, uh, or starting, you know, when I had, you know, if you wanted to go to the internet in Philly, you know, commercially, you had to go through me, uh, you know, uh, it was the internet pusher. Uh, and it was fun, you know, and it's still fun. Yeah. Uh, did you have a, something that was like the f- internet equivalent of flying cars? Like, was, was there something futuristic that you were expecting to happen? No, I, you know, I guess, as I said, I'm not actually a visionary. I don't sit around dreaming. I don't write science fiction. I think that I can often see the, you know, natural implications and conclusions one or two steps ahead, but I wasn't sitting around thinking, you know, if only we could, uh, whatever the equivalent of transporters on the internet are, you know, now I think about that some, it's not what I'm engaged in, but I think, you know, what's the right answer to how to mix a more libertarian approach to not censoring people because my grandparents who were born here, but definitely of the depression and, you know, sort of their families were affected by the Holocaust, deeply thought that restrictions on speech were more harmful, uh, you know, than, than not being able to have open discourse. But at the same time, we now have doxing and, you know, targeted misinformation. So I think that's a much more interesting problem to solve. And I have some ideas about it, but that's not what I'm doing. (laughs) So, uh, so I think that'd be very meaningful. And I, Look forward to people trying to figure that out uh, in a way that doesn't, you know, that, that as I said, in Ender's Game, uh, you know, there was this myth, mythical, like, net that everyone talked on. And they disagreed, but they managed to do so without wanting to kill each other so right. or, or think that each other were not human. So I'm not sure how we get there. Yeah. And, and it's it's hard. Like, some of those concepts just don't, like, are, are, are based in the speed at which information could travel. Yeah. Right. So it's like I always say today, like, you know, if the Bible got a rewrite, you know, maybe one of the commandments would today would be don't use nuclear weapons. Right. Mm-hmm. But they didn't exist. So it's not really uh, wasn't topical at the time. Things like, you know, free the restrictions or lack thereof on free speech were also based upon the conceived notions of what speech was at the time right. and how quickly it could be transmitted to people and stuff like that, which it isn't to say that that it uh, the ideas are bad. It's just you're basing them in certain notions about uh, what you're talking about. And then when you go, well, actually that's changed substantially. Okay. Well, the underlying principles might need a slight adjustment to the reality right. of, of 2023. Um, but, but to the question you ask, I mean, isn't it pretty amazing that we're going at, I don't know, what is it? 800 gigabits and it's still ethernet. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, not only that, I like, I, I was talking to him the other day. I said, you know what? I, my current frustration is that the mobile device in my pocket is only operating at OC3 right. speeds today and not uh, the OC192 right. speed I would like it to be operating at because I'm an extra 30 feet away from the cell tower. Right. Um, and if there was like, no iPhone, Android would be magical. If there was right. no Android, Windows Mobile, not Wince, but the other Windows thing with yep. the tiles that they polluted Windows with. Would, would be pretty good compared to Wince and Palm and all that. And like, or Symbian? Was it, was it Symbian? Was that yeah, one? Yeah, hold on. The same? Where's mine? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Scion 5. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, sometimes Ooh. sometimes all I want is a, nice. is a Blackberry oh. scroll wheel in my life. Yes. Okay. Ooh, this is nice. I like this. I like the Scion. Well, okay. So along those lines then, what is what held your attention right now? What are you curious about? Well, you know, at Kentic, we're, like many other software companies, applying AI technologies uh, to making people's lives better. And we've been doing that, but with LLM, I think there's a really interesting opportunity that we're going to do for Kentic at Kentic, but not for the general space, to combine the legacy pre-AI winter AI technologies and building semantic models, which won't get you to general AI, but can be helpful for reasoning with LLMs, which don't reason, but do some pretty cool unintended stuff. 
right? Because mm-hmm. in the Kentic world, you know, we're not a sim. You know, when we generate an alert, people are going to be woken up or signal their infrastructure or automate or whatever. So we got to be pretty sure, you know, that it's the right thing to do. And so it's pretty, you know, I was fortunate to work with my uncle who was doing arrhythmia detection, symbolic list machines and fuzzy logic expert system, signals analysis, um, you know, applying, you know, building a reasoning model to combine with the LM based stuff is something I don't see a lot of people doing. And I think it's generalizable to a lot of problem domains. We're doing it at Kentic and uh, that's my focus right now, obviously. Uh, but I think that combination, I expect to see more and more companies do because it's going to be very hard to apply, you know, even just diffing, like, you know, knowing you, you do change the training set some, and then you get different, you know, outputs, the closer you are to automation or operating on someone or, you know, mm. those kind of things, the more important it's going to be to do the XAI, the explainable AI equivalent for the space. And, you know, Kentic, we can't use the telemetry data for some of the training stuff because that's not my data, it's your data. Um, right. But how people use Kentic to say, okay, when I do this, what does that lead to in the debugging path and, and learning from that? Absolutely, yes. On the other hand, just because someone misclicked once, I'd like the system to know that that doesn't make sense. Um, right. Especially if it's again going to lead to some automated suggestions about how to tune up your, you know, your infrastructure. So I think that approach is really interesting, and exciting. I haven't seen enough people talking about it, but I expect people will will figure it out and get there. Um, sure. And obviously, I'm not going to go to a startup based on that because I'm occupied. I'm busy. Yeah. Is this the longest? Do you, is this your longest stint? How long were you at Akamai? 9.9 years. And where, where are we at in Kentic, in de- in uh, rounded to the nearest decimal? Depends how you define it. So we started okay. the company in, I guess we might be at 9.9 years, because we started the company uh, February 2014. Okay. So probably about 9.9 years. But, you know, I built the prototype for it, and we got funded September but the company existed and it was just four of us working uh, before yeah. that. So I built the prototype, probably started late sometime in 2012 with my uncle, um, uh, trying to build, you know, building the clustered backend. I cheated as good architects do. I used MapR, which was like a Hadoop slash NFS hybrid. Uh, yeah. So I didn't have to do replication and, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so yeah, a longer than that. And, and while, my ISP felt like a long time. It actually wasn't that long. It was like late 92 to, by the time I was you know, already at above net in, at the end of 98. So it wasn't actually that long. It's just super intense. So concentrated yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're going to cross some sort of wave, wave a flag. Uh, it's now the longest. Um, yeah. I, I don't think about milestones like that. So, you know, yeah. I mean, Gail and I were married 30 years this year. Um, uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so, you know, and at some point it'll be 50. Because, you know, right. uh, we just get older. So far, I don't this, feel... This, old, this feels like but, that poker, it's all one continuous uh, yes, session analogy. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's what it is, right? We get up. I feel like the, uh, uh, the uh, Johnny Five in mm. uh, Short Circuit. You know, yeah. I'm a chrome-breasted input eater. It's like, I get up, <laughs> I look for things that are fun to do, I do it, try to make stuff the customers want, get more customers, have happy yeah. employees. If it isn't Kentic, you know, someone uh, was interested in acquiring Kentic at one point that, you know, and Gail was like, look, are you going to start another company? Like, yes, uh, at some point, at some point. And so she's like, you know, unless Kentic is, you know, Akamai sized and goes on for 30 years like Akamai or 25 years like Akamai, but Akamai will probably go for 30 plus years. And she's like, well, then you should be happy. So like, don't go work for people that you're not going to be happy working for. So right. I'll always be doing something. Uh, it's just yeah. a question of what I'd like to think I could do something outside of infrastructure, but signs are bad. <laughs> if you project <laughs> in the past, seems likely. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't think we're going to get API to away. So, uh, you know, right. you're an amazing, trusty little APIs all alike. I don't think it's going to remove, you know, the need for people that actually help people who run infrastructure. So, right. Well, I mean, you've had a, a pretty, 
by any measure, successful uh, career. Um, what's something that sticks out to you that you failed at along the way? So I really suck at product marketing. I suck so badly that I spent eight years at Akamai trying desperately to convince Akamai to create cloud. Mm. And I suck so badly that we were calling it native edge computing, which is now a thing. Right. Uh, now, and you said you reason. weren't a visionary. Uh, well, yeah, I guess it was pretty painfully obvious to me. And and that net deploy, you know, which is like Puppet or Chef or whatever, you know, is like people would want to use the logging system, uh, query, which is a distributed real time, uh, you know, metric system. Like Arkham had all this cool shit, and I was like, people would love to use that, but. I both failed to really make the business case, even though we had customers that wanted to do it. And we did it. We actually, I'm like, well, I'll just set up some servers and rent it to them. Like, I don't know how to do that. But that also, you know, people like, well, he's an ISP and that's a low margin business. And we couldn't get the capital. And some of those may have been right. Yeah. So obviously it was still to me that they bought Linode and there was at least a Friedman running cloud and can take for a little bit, um, uh, you know, when Noam ran it. But I think a lot of it was communication. I didn't know how to speak to, you know, a lot of the people that were on the product side, um, you know, just didn't come from the infrastructure space. Were more MIS or MBA than than computer science background. Um, and you know, as you said, like how people buy, why they buy, what the ROI is, like those are all very important things. So it was sort of like sprung to life, obvious in my head. But getting it out and communicating it was difficult. And it's something we still struggle with, um, you know, at at Kentic is a lot of our customers since the very beginning, we're like, I can finally answer my questions uh, and I can enrich and I can do anything, you know, ask, you know, infinite cardinality. But when people go, okay, but why why do people need this instead of data dog or smunk? Sometimes we struggle to help our practitioners explain that to their bosses. And usually we don't, but sometimes we do. And so, uh, you know, that's that product marketing um, kind of skill, articulating, you know, why things are different before or after. And, and, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, I can see it because, like, I have to go do what I call vendor torture at trade shows because the correct thing for many audiences is to talk about not what you do, but what the benefit is. But then 50 different companies that do 50 different things all have the same benefit. And to me, it's like, ah, I don't understand. So, uh, you know, but there's a lot of people that don't think like me in the world. And and that's just a discipline that um, so failed to get Akamai to do that um, definitely, uh, you know, has been something that hasn't held Kentic back. But, you know, we probably could have done better if we had better product marketing shops you know, through the history. And if I were better at that. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to switch to the mailbag here. We have some viewer questions for you. Uh Uh, Cue the music. First question here for Avi. Um, What is the single coolest piece of technology behind the scenes at Kentic today? What are you most proud of? You know, that would still be, we call it KDE, the Kentic data engine. Um, the reality of dealing with network data forced us to solve for some problems that are very hard that a lot of other observability systems haven't solved for. Now, when we started Kentic, we talked a lot about that. Now, we do a lot as a product, and so that's where we focus. So rather than you know the key to use our moat and you know enrichment and coloring, but still, um, you know if you think about taking DNS queries and associating them with flow in real time or updating, you know, flow with BGP or, uh, you know, IP geography, which is, you know, could be changing very frequently. General, having generalized that ability via API and letting people map, you know, IPAM information or netbox information or things like that. And then, you know, uh, my co-founder, you know, added streaming database to it. You know, that backend gives us a ton of flexibility and is key to being able to run the business efficiently, you know. So the provisioning system may be number two, but you know, net booted, bare metal, containerized. But probably in terms of technology, it'd probably still be the back end. But I'm biased because that was, you know. Now, what's interesting, and I can send you for the show notes, is the poster we did in 2015 about yeah. the roadmap for KDE, which was called Hydra SQL at the time. Yeah. Um, 
it's completely wrong. Like, <laughs> I thought we'd have erasure coding for more efficient storage mm-hmm. and better caching in a certain dimension and, like, the things that... But at the same time, solving enough of each problem in a decoupled way so that we could, you know, change the wheels, you know, we got right. And so, you know, it's very different than it was when it started, but, uh, you know, lets us do a lot. Okay. Well, we're de- I'm definitely going to get that for the show notes then. Okay. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, that's the way products, I think, naturally evolve, right? Is like, yeah. What it, planning is everything. And, uh, but that's a, now I'm going to blank on it. I think it was, I don't know. Right? How to yeah, it's like pla- planning no is everything, but plans are worthless. Right. And no battle survives contact, first contact with the enemy. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, something yes. like that. Yeah. Um, I'm much more of Napoleon's battle Or the plan. customer. Or the yeah. customer. <laughs> yeah. I like Napoleon's battle plan. First we show up, then we see what happens. That's the plan. Um, right. uh, somebody told me recently, they're like, you view life as like a side-scrolling video game. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's probably right. Um, yeah. It, Avi, what is your most memorable poker hand? Well, I have had a poker hand. We ran it twice, and I got a one-outer than a two-outer, and I've had that executed against me. And I have mm. to say the, the time where it was executed against me for you know a pot the size of a decent car is probably pretty memorable, and that was... Uh, against Tom Dwan, who had manipulated himself to, you know, like I started sneezing and said, like, he wanted the seat over there, you know, instead. So uh, mm. uh, I should have objected, but uh, didn't at the time. So, uh, you know, it was for enough that, uh, you know, it was memorable. And, uh, you know, I don't seek out the suffer and torture you know i'm not like larry ellison playing poker you know like i want my enemies to be bloody and dismembered on the floor uh (laughs) but i like i like winning money right so sure uh so you know more when i get sucked out on but i don't tell those stories a lot because one of the one of the lessons of poker club is no one fucking cares no one wants to hear your big beat story yeah suck it up kid there again i think there's some life lessons in there too (laughs) yes uh (laughs) Uh, okay, here's this one's really on the spot. Avi, is there a cloud provider you think is doing network observability stuff right today? And if so, why? I think Google's the closest. Not because of their, their observability suite, but because their VPC flow log infrastructure gives people the ability to sample, which increases the chance that people will use it because it's too expensive for a lot of people in Azure and, and OCI, you know, and uh, Amazon. And it has performance data because it comes from the operations side. Now, it does mean the security people don't get the deny logs that they get from Amazon and Azure, which they like, but as an operational, you know, sort of background person, I think it's really amazing. Even though we sell a synthetics offering, if yeah. you can get truth from the traffic it's always going to be better than what if delayed super low res data sure. um, they have something that with information center it's just the google ecosystem and you know it's not I mean, it's the best of the clouds uh offerings everybody else you basically get to look at traffic as if it's syslog which is i can tell you not very helpful uh so <laughs> uh but i i don't really know that any of them have you know the most amazing observability suite especially when it comes to infrastructure um mm-hmm. but even when it comes to tracing and pulling this together now i expect that'll change over time the question is is that the right thing for them to sell more gcp aws azure you know i don't know i'm not their product groups but um i can tell you that we're working there's more interest than there was in extending telemetry you know we've had conversations with people like you know if you could give us the bgp with the with the flow logs that'd be awesome like we don't use bgp <laughs> Like, I assure you, you do. Like, what they mean is they don't use it as like their, they don't use Cisco's in right. their data center. Like, I assure yeah. you, you connect to the internet, you use BGP. But uh, yeah. we don't use BGP. Um, but yeah, um, so I think Google has the best observability enabling ecosystem, and they've at least tried with the Network Information Center. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, look forward to seeing other folks do more. Okay. All right. You survived the mailbag. Um, I had one, uh, one thing I meant to ask you earlier and I'm, I'm, I can't believe I forgot, uh, something near and dear to your heart. 
was Usenet the first blockchain? I mean, Usenet was the first social network. It was the first decentralized system. But it's like with always the, been, Usenet with parity bits. Is that is that no, not a blockchain? No, because it's always been possible to forge the bank path. Mm. So, you know, I think it has to be immutable. At least, you know, the historic parts that you, you are going to add on to yeah. for it to be blockchain. Maybe I'm being too literal, though. Yeah. But well, I'd I mean, love to see maybe the first consensus algorithm, large scale consensus algorithm. Well, but again, I don't know that it actually was because there's nothing that prevented you. You could send a, 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 a corrupted message with a, the same message ID, mm -hmm. and there's no signing of the content there's no hash of the content or signing of that so if if you happen to be there first with a given message id then i'm going to trust you right. so sorry to, sorry to spoil the analogy but That's it was okay. certainly the first social network and yeah you know i'd be really curious i would certainly i would have passion for seeing usenet take down reddit but yeah. you know there would need to be a lot of work done because there's obviously a lot of crap in fact google just got depeared from they 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 made the it their own decision they said <laughs> well we're disconnecting google groups is disconnecting from usenet but there was yeah. just a lot of spam they weren't going to be fighting now right. i think there's approaches where you could do curation as an overlay on top of say usenet in an uncensorable way yeah you know because usenet deals with dmca deals with csam in its own way although it's not regulated so uh you know but if you did that you'd also be contributing to the balkanization of society where people only look at the stuff that they want to, that they, that makes them comfortable and amplifies, but right. People already do that. So, you know, whatever. Sure. Did Usenet, like you going back to the conversation earlier, let me pull out my Televate, Televate trailblazer UECP modem here. Perfect. Did Usenet have that the same negative, feedback loop thing that you see in social media today and and if not why not so the number of cranks was such was low enough and before isps even you know sort of in the isp era a little bit because there was there was netiquette if you've heard the term you know that you could just use something called kill files so if you didn't like Carl Denninger, who now is on TV doing stock picks, or at least was a little while ago, yeah. um, you just kill file him. And then you wouldn't see – you'd see people responding to him, but you wouldn't see him or her or whoever. So, you know, the sysadmins after the eternal September – after the September, you know, effect stuff. Hold on. But before – just for people – just talk about eternal September. Just – because so there, there was, probably is a social media, like that might yeah. be the answer to the question, right? But so before the eternal September, there was the September effect. So basically, you know, university was the main way people got on Usenet. People would get their accounts, they discover Usenet, and then you know, September, October, every year there'd be this wave of people not who didn't know what netiquette was, you know, uh, and so uh, you know they'd be flaming people, whatever, um, and so reposting, spamming, whatever, and so the admins. You know, sometimes even in the companies that were connected to Usenet at the time would put the smack down. Those are the boffs, the bastard operators from hell. And they would use the LART, the loser attitude readjustment tool, and, uh, you know, explain to them the error of their ways. And then, then you know, so every, there was the September effect. And then AOL connected to Usenet. And then that became, I think it was AOL was the was the impetus. CompuServe became, was there too, but yeah. Yeah, the CompuServe was, again, like it cost $10 an hour. So you had to really care. Right. And it was few enough people you could kill file them. So it became so the eternal September was the never ending world of of new folks getting on who were like, Who the hell are you to tell me how to behave? Americans, you know. <laughs> fuck yeah. So uh you know, and, and, and Usenet never really evolved a good way of helping people sort through that. Didn't have the feeds, didn't have so, you know, I think there's ways again of you know, following people that you like in, in the more modern decentralized social ways where, you know, uh, people would publish a feed of that. People would, you know, you can give people choice, but we'll see, you know, that's not what it's not, uh, you know, using it's much smaller than it was. Uh, yeah. And a lot of that text, there's still text groups going. Um, but, 
if I could wave my magic wand, forget about Reddit. Phase one would be move everyone using a PHP BB to Usenet. Uh, but I think there needs to be an app, you know, for that to work. So sure. But there's still PHP BBs. You know, you go two plus two. I think is a poker forum. I think that's still some horrible forum software. You know, if you want to look at your my 2004 Volkswagen R32 or my Jeep Trackhawk, that's like a PHP BB type forum. You know, it's yeah. pretty sad. That yeah, was state of the art at the time, though. No, Usenet was better than PHP BB, <laughs> I think, strictly. But whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will. We'll let the Usenet. We'll let the Usenet continue to Usenet. Um, yes. What's the? Uh, this is a random one. What's the strangest thing in your morning routine? You must have quirks. I know you. You must have in your routine. Maybe if you don't, morning doesn't jump out. Just in your routines. I mean, I weigh myself every morning, uh, and I, I travel with a scale. So Gail thinks that's sort of silly to travel yeah. with a scale, but uh, that's I guess that's not too weird. Um, yeah. In my daily routine, I mean, I spend about an hour and a half a day on Feedly, maybe an mm. hour a day, including Hacker News goes into Feedly. I found some okay. way to, you know, and so, you know, do I really need to be doing that, um, you know, for competitive info or whatever? I mean, maybe not. So it's just a little bit of recreation and a little bit not, but uh, that's probably pretty hardcore. Uh, but it's yeah. also a time to disconnect. It's a time to scan the universe. The only problem is sometimes my news is 30 days old because I can't keep up with it. So yep. 30 days is when it stops marking it as read or unread. So I, I'm always like 30 days delayed, uh, you know, on my RSS. That's like in uh, in Jamaica when I was a kid. We used to get the USA yesterday. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never showed up on time. Okay. Uh, story time with Avi. Um, what was the worst day? in your career and what has been the best day in your career a career or life you, your choice i mean worst day in my life was when my mother passed away in a plane accident uh the uh best day was probably getting married um mm. so uh in career you know, I think our, our first, I can't name names, but, you know, we had a multi-hundred thousand dollar, turned out to be on-prem customer for Kentic in 2015, early, like early after we started in 2015, because one company, actually it wasn't one company ate the other, it was these two companies needed to split apart and they mm -hmm. couldn't figure out like what was what network and they needed to split it apart. And I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this is real. Maybe, maybe people really need this. Uh, you know, worst day in my career was certainly nine 11. Uh, cause Danny Lewin, who was the founding co-founder and founding CTO at Akamai was, you know, an extraordinary individual and was, uh, the first person killed by the terrorists in nine 11. So, uh, that was certainly super tough and, uh, you know, a lot of fallout from that. Sure. Well, uh, before I let you go, uh, well, two things, actually. First question, yes. what is the cloud and where is it located? Uh, I mean, the cloud is just other people's computers, storage and network, right? <laughs> and it's located, so I've been in told. it's located 98% in Ashford, Virginia, as far as I can tell, because every time I'm down there, I just keep driving and it's like, data center, data center data center, you know, it's, it's like, I don't even know what the IR map of, uh, Ashburn would look like, but, uh, it's pretty, under I remember when the first year, uh, DFT DuPont Fabros was being built there and Apple, Microsoft, Google, they're like, yeah, that's my data center. I'm like I can't all be your data center, you know? So when wholesale was getting going and now there's a hundred buildings like that, I mean, yeah. I just, I don't even know how to, it's like scale. is just hard to comprehend. Like a book that would actually be interesting to read would be like, you know, whoever was on the Loudoun County supervisory board for the last, you know, 15 years, whoever said like, hey, oh, yeah. we should do this and generate some tax revenue here. And well, it's it. all Barry Gosnell's fault. Go on. Okay. So remember May East? Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we were for in those who don't. Building. So, so <laughs> for those for those who don't go take us back to the 50 days. Okay. 
Uh, so the Metropolitan Area Ethernet Exchange, although I did make a Metropolitan Avi Exchange, according to Rob Seastrom, when they stopped selling ports on May East and I hooked up a Gigaswitch to May East and sold ports on that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, so that was uh, networks interconnecting to each other. And, uh, and was located where? In Tyson's Corner in Vienna, Virginia. And, uh, you know, part of it was a 1919 Gallows, and the other part was at 8100 Boone. And uh, 8100 Boone was owned by a gentleman. Um, and he wanted, he was like, ah, the internet is in my building. The internet is my building. I remember we wanted to get AT&T fiber, and he wanted to charge them $2 million to put a hole in the building. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people had, we were fed up, and then, Worldcom was like, uh, okay, fuck it, we've got we got a place in Ashburn, and you know, sort of started doing. Uh, I think they were trying to do frame at the time, frame and ATM, whatever. Uh, you know, but they basically moved it out, moved the center of it out there, and then other people started doing data center stuff out there. So probably there just wasn't enough space and power in Tyson's to be the center of the internet anymore. But yeah. you know, uh, also. We either needed like municipal pipes with pull strings, or my favorite was road zippers. Like we need road zippers because there was so much fiber going in 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 the in the in the nineties that uh, you know it was like always impossible to drive around there. So certainly much more tractable out there, but uh, yeah. uh, definitely scary what would happen if we lost uh, the Ashburn area. So yeah, um, and uh, give everybody uh, a little tip. What is the best? piece of software gadget thing that's uh, entered your life in the last 12 months that everybody should know about? Well, I'm probably a little bit on the autistic spectrum, although I don't know if I was growing up, but I'm very sense I can be easily distracted by noise. So I found these, um, they're not white noise generators. They're noise sort of canceling earplugs that also have foam and go in. And mm. it, it um, helps me uh, get back to sleep after I wake up at night or, you know, it's not really a stay asleep type thing, but I'm very sensitive yeah. to, to street noise. Or noise. I grew up in the suburbs where other than the train, it was pretty quiet. So, mm. you know, I sleep in cities. So uh, that was, I'm blanking on the brand name, but I can find it. Um, but yeah. that was pretty cool. I mean, Simple things like five years ago, I started traveling with thermoses so that my diet Pepsi wouldn't get warm. And I was like, I knew what thermoses were, but how did I forget about them for like 20 years of my life? You know? Yeah. So there's simple things uh, that uh, can make a big difference sometimes. What's one more simple thing? I mean, suitcases with big wheels, Remova in particular, but, uh, yeah. you know, if you travel a lot, um, I don't know battery battery chargers uh you know i don't know i could make a list yeah well okay before i let you go are, are do you remain the uh chief su sushi consumer at uh, kentuck no probably not i've lost about 80 pounds this year um and i mean even sashimi i'm probably not able to put it away like i was uh i have only been are you sitting down yeah i think you are i think i've only been to fogo twice this year maybe three times and they're putting one in a couple blocks from me in seattle too but wow. uh yeah uh wow. so i'm trying to i was like yeah i'm 54 it's gonna get harder to lose weight uh i know some of the formula from doing it before and then yeah. i cheated using I cheated using the drugs for about three months this year and then they sort yeah. of stopped working and i just said whatever it's fine i'll just go back to the gazenta gazauta calculation and and make it work yeah. so wow so, I mean, Fogo revenue's got to be down on a worldwide basis, I yeah. would think. Yeah. I actually had a bet to not drink Diet Pepsi for 90 days. And I think Pepsi, beginning of this year, and uh, I think Pepsi, uh, definitely their stock was affected. So, Did you did you win the bet? Did you make it? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. that big a deal. So I, so I did the same-ish thing. Like, I, I went cold turkey on Diet Coke for like 60 days and said, I'm going to feel so much better. I'm not the blah, blah. I, I felt exactly the same. I think I got later. 20 minutes more sleep. So mm. I do try to drink uh, sparkling ice, raspberry flavor, flavored stuff or whatever. I mm. think for me, 
um, I, as I, I'm now old enough, like I can drink two liters of Diet Pepsi and then go to bed, but it's definitely, I always have trouble going to bed my entire life. But I think if I, you know, even no matter how intentional I am, if I have not had any caffeine for the few hours before, uh, I think it, I think it, it helps. So, uh, you know, maybe, All right. I, who, I need, didn't feel... who needs Huberman when you've got the, uh, the, uh, drink two liters of diet, diet Pepsi and go to bed and sleep method. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> All right, Avi, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you. Amazing insights as always. Uh, I hope to see you sooner than later. Evidently not at a Fogo, but we'll find some place. Uh, we can uh, figure acceptable. it out. Okay. We can go to the Chicago Fogo for old time sake. Sake. See if the uh, meat sommelier is still working there. Perfect. Excellent. All right, Avi. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. This is different. Another round. So much more to talk about. Gonna aim to satisfy with help from cash fly. Get to it. Do it fast. Right here on the Innycast. Make it strong. Make it last. Right here on the Innycast. The Innycast podcast. Brought to you by Cashfly.